We're going to be turning in our Bibles tonight to, to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at verse number 38. And while you're going there tonight, you're getting it out and you're getting ready to look over it. I want to tell you tonight, if you're listening online or you're here, this might be one of the most difficult pills you ever swallowed. Anybody ever read different things in the Bible that's a command and you think, oh, that's not too hard. And then you read other stuff and you're like, man, that's tough. You know why I say that? Because we all have a flesh man to contend with. I'm going to tell you tonight that this, that I'm going to preach to you, this command of God is probably one of the most difficult for many people to obey than many, many other commands in the Bible. And if I had to guess, most every person listening at some point has had to contend with a flesh man in regards to what Jesus addresses. So when the Lord put it on my heart, I, I got looking into it, and man, I'm telling you, it just it opened up to me in a new way, and I want to share it with you. But I want you to see something before we read the text because I don't want you to miss it. As we read this text tonight, I want you to see that much of what Jesus has to say deals with our reaction, your reaction, my reaction. In other words, the way we react to trouble, problems, people, things that are done, said to us, especially the way we act when we are treated a certain way. Am I the only one tonight that... I may get upset if someone treats me wrong, but it goes to a whole nother level when it's my wife and my kids. Anybody feel the same way? There's been times that I've regretted the way that I acted or reacted because of the way I was treated. So think about that tonight because I believe that most of us would agree that we could all use a little help in the area of how we react. Anybody ever heard the term a knee-jerk reaction? You know what that means? That's like you ever had that doctor when they take that little triangular thing and they bop you on the knee with it, and, and all of a sudden your knee pops out and you just about kick the doctor? That knee-jerk reaction is that instantaneous movement it almost happens before you really think about it. Let's look at God's Word because I feel like God's going to talk to you and He's going to talk to me. He's already been talking to me. Verse 38, Matthew 5 and 38, if you got it, say amen. amen. You have heard that had have been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that you resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. I want you to notice something because I'll miss it if I don't show you now. This word resist, when you read it and it says, but I say unto you that you resist not evil, if you just skim over that, it almost sounds like that he's saying, don't put up with. But the resisting in the original Greek, this word resist, is the word eth is teme, which means to oppose, to stand against, to resist, or to withstand. So let's read that again, that you resist not evil. In other words, that is to oppose, don't oppose it. Wow, that sounds kind of crazy, doesn't it? That you don't stand against it or resist, you resist it or, or withstand it. A lot can be said there, and I'm going to preach this out with the Lord's help, but I wanted to make that point so you don't misunderstand. But I say unto you that you resist 
not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, you ever had anybody take something from you? The Bible says, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain, or go him with him twice as far. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn thou not away. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But listen to what Jesus says. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Let me ask you, has anybody in this room ever felt like someone used you? Have you ever felt like someone despitefully used you? You ever felt like you've been persecuted by anybody? He says that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Anybody see why I said this is one of the hardest one of the hardest commands that some people have to grapple with. You see what I'm saying now? With the Lord's help tonight, I'd like to talk on the subject. I don't know that I've ever preached on this before, but I want to talk to us tonight on the subject title of the controversial slap. The controversial slap. Would you bow your head with me tonight? Let's pray and ask God to have His will and way here tonight. Father, we thank you for the Word of God. In my human flesh or human nature, human wisdom, I pray, God, that you'll help me not to sow in or add in anything that does not belong in this message tonight. I pray, God, that you'll set a guard at my lips, my heart, my mind. Let the Spirit of the Lord speak into my heart and allow me, help me, to say everything that I should. Help us as a people to take away exactly from the Word of God the intent that you had for each and every one of us. For the people that are listening here tonight and those online who have a real issue, a struggle with what I have talked about already, I pray God give them strength and understanding and we'll praise you for everything accomplished and everyone can say amen. So talk to you tonight on the subject of the controversial slap. Uh, although I was not watching it at the time, I don't usually pay much attention to stuff like that. It's not my thing. I wasn't watching it when it occurred, but it wasn't long ago, some of you may remember this, that the Internet, television, all sorts of different outlets blew up all over the place with a viral video clip of Will Smith at the 2022 Oscars. Anybody saw that where he walked up to the stage and slapped Chris Rock across the face for what he felt like was a distasteful, slanderous joke that was directed at his wife, Jada Smith. Uh, some of you have seen that just like I do, and it when I saw that, I, I noticed something about it that I noticed quite often in our generation. There was a lot of public dissension about this secular event. People were divided. There were people that on one side, they were saying, well, you know, Chris Rock deserved what he got. And then there were other people on the other side of that. They were saying that uh, Will Smith was a jerk and that he should have never walked up on the stage. He should be banned. He should never be allowed back. There were some people saying, man, that old Chris Rock, he really showed some temperance there, and, and he, he was the better man of the whole thing. And then there were other people that said, what a coward Chris Rock is. Had that been me, 
and somebody walked up on the stage and slapped me like that, I'd have knocked them into next year. Come on and say amen. That's just the way that it was. It was divided. Yet as divided as this secular public event was on what I could call the world stage, I can assure you that in a great deal of the current church world today, if the same thing would have happened in the church, I'd hate to use just any well-known household name, but let's just say that Billy Graham was still alive and somebody walked up and slapped him in the face and, and, uh, because he said something they didn't like. I can assure you that in the church world that we live in today, that even today in the church is so divided amongst itself when it should not be, there would be a lot of people on one side saying, well, he deserved it. Other people saying he did the right thing. Some that would say, man, I'm telling you, he really kept his composure. He did the, right, he did the Christ-like thing. Others saying, man, it, it's a good thing he didn't slap me. If he'd have slapped me, he'd have been slapping the wrong one. As a matter of fact, not too long ago, I, I began to look and see in different uh, circles that this, I don't know if it's a meme or just a, a post somebody has been resharing. And to be honest with you, I thought it was kind of funny myself, but it said something to the, the degree of that uh, the Bible says that we're supposed to forgive 77 times 7. And I don't remember what that is, the exact number. What is it, 444, 445, or 49 or something? And it said something to the degree I come 450. I, I'm, I'm come on my out slapping. That's what I'm going to come out punching. So just get ready on 400 and whatever, 51. And, you know, on the surface, it's kind of funny because it's only meant to be a joke. But as I was riding to church tonight, I was thinking to myself, you know, there are actually people that literally think like that. And, uh, and don't really see that there's anything wrong with that. But I can tell you that the, that the genuine reaction of the child of God and how that we would handle most any situation, we're divided because we don't always understand what it is that God expects out of us. As a matter of fact, if you lined up 10 different people from 10 different denominations, you might get 10 different varieties of interpretation of what this passage that I have read to you tonight means to the child of God. You've got people that will go from one extreme to the other. Some that says that we're just supposed to let anybody beat and pummel us. Others that I mean if somebody even sneezes in our direction and they ain't got a mask on, that it's all right to club them to death. Come on now. There's people on all sides of the fence if you did not know, which is all the more reason that I believe tonight for us as a people in 2023 going into 24 to reevaluate what the Scripture says about situations in our life like this. Now, I've never been to the Oscars. I've never been in a situation exactly like they were in, but I've been in some pretty similar situations. And as a matter of fact, I wish that I could tell you that I've always handled every situation exactly the way the Lord would want me to have handled them, but I have not always. But there is a difference between someone who becomes arrogant in posturing about making the wrong choice or doing the wrong thing or being like Peter and pulling out a sword when the Lord's trying to tell you to put it back in the sheath and cutting a soldier's ear off. There's a difference between someone who goes away with a spirit of arrogance and thankful that they did what they did even though they did the wrong thing and someone that says, woe is me, God. Help me to get my act together I failed the test come on and say amen to me somebody but I want you to see that when we look at verse number 38 Jesus begins in verse number 38 by rehearsing an old proverb has anyone ever heard this old proverb I, I mean I wasn't a Christian and even as a young heathen I remember people and hearing older folks who would throw this around a lot of times they would use it to justify fist fighting and brawling and acting a fool an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth in other words if you punch 
punch me in the eye, you're going to get punched right back. If you knock one of my teeth out, I'm going to knock one of yours out. As a matter of fact, you knock one of my baby teeth out, I'm knocking all your teeth out. You'll be walking away with dentures whenever we're done with all this. I'm going to knock your teeth, clean down your throat, and then snatch them back out and hand them to the dentist when we're done with this whole thing. Come on, you're going to need reconstructive surgery if you just touch me. Don't even come in my space. Come on and say amen. That is the attitude that sometimes that we can have. But Jesus rehearses this old proverb that has been around for so long, this eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But instead of Jesus promoting it or celebrating it, he chooses to renounce that ideal or those ideals. Instead, he says in verse number 39, but I say, but I want you to hear that now, but I say, this is Jesus talking, unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Did you hear that? If whoever smites you on the right cheek, he said, turn to them the other also. But I want you to take for a moment because a lot of times uh, these passages are not preached on uh, and there's way too much misunderstanding. How many will allow me to break it down tonight to make sense out of this? Hey Amen. I want you to see it for yourself. Hey Amen. Brother Bill, can you come here for a second? I don't know. Maybe I can get you to help me. Hey, just walk on up here. Take your time if you need to. But I want you to consider the language of the text. How many, whoever else read that and it said smite thee on the right cheek. Now I want you to just be my example tonight, okay? You're gonna be the person that gets slapped. I'm not gonna slap you so you don't have to worry. If you get slapped on the right cheek, show me where your right cheek is. It's on that side of your face. I want you to break this down because if, if you don't, you just miss this stuff. And so this is your right cheek. How many of you know what, what is the predominant hand or the, the, the hand that is predominant as far as who a left-handed or a right-handed person? What is it? It's right-handed. The majority of people are right-handed. And so for me to hit you on the left cheek with my right hand, which would be the most common thing, some might say that don't really make sense. Now does it? How am I going to punch you on the left side or the right side of your face when you're facing me just like that. I'm going to show you the reason why that is relevant tonight. Given the fact that this population was overwhelmingly right-handed, and we've seen that through history, if someone were to punch you, it would more likely have to be on the left cheek. And this is declared in a time in history when the Roman soldiers would often degrade and discipline slaves and other people by doing something that we call backhanding somebody. Now, I want you to understand, when you backhand somebody, that is not a cold cock somebody. And uh, you ever heard that terminology? This outright knock somebody upside the head with all your knuckle sandwich. Uh, when you backhand somebody, that means you're going to come like this with your right hand. Now, wouldn't that make more sense of what Jesus is talking about? It's not like somebody just walking out and knocking your dentures into next week. It is somebody degrading your character and someone that is called coming against you in a disciplinary type way. And when we see this, this was a common practice in their day to backhand someone. The reason that I tell you, you can be seated, brother, that this is important because what Jesus Jesus is implying was a clear form of character degradation and humiliation. Anyone else pick up on that? That is a clear symbol of someone degrading or humiliating your character. That's You ever heard someone say that in our western culture that's a slap in the face. Have you ever heard that? The whole idea behind that it is to degrade. It is almost like trying you. It's not completely knocking you out, but just enough to be like, look how 
brazen that I am. I'm going to slap you in the face. What is important in this is the fact that this is not a guy getting knocked out. This is not a guy getting the daylights beating out of him. This is not a guy who's having his wife raped or his home broken into. This is a guy that is being backhanded in his face. And Jesus says when that happens, what I want you to do is I want you to offer them the other cheek because here is the thing. Although the slap that Jesus mentions is physical in its insult, it is also a parable to the truth of verbal and emotional insults of our character, our reputation, and our dignity. Listen, Jesus says if you get slapped, I want you to offer the other cheek. And it's important to realize that because turning the other cheek does not imply that I'm turning a blind eye to your foolishness. It does not mean I'm turning a blind eye to lasciviousness or recklessness. It simply means that I am avoiding confrontation that has not escalated to the point that my life is in jeopardy. Did anyone else pick up on that tonight? He's not not telling you to overlook sin. He's not telling you to let the enemy run roughshod. Amen. Hurt your babies and break into your homes and rape your wives. That's not what God's trying to tell you. It's not that if you got a gun sitting in the safe that you're ungodly. Amen. What you need to see that what Jesus is describing is symbolic to our avoidance of confrontation militant spirits and even forms of violence whenever it is possible. Let me explain to you the way that Matthew Henry put it because I like the way he said this. He said, suffer any injury that can be borne for the sake of peace, committing your concerns to the Lord's keeping. Now, if I reflect back on that crazy secular incident where that Chris Rock got slapped in the face, If you watch that video, that was a pretty serious slap in the face. It wasn't no light slap. He slapped him pretty hard. You can hear that slap. That's why they call it the slap heard around the world. But here's what people said about Chris Rock. They said, man, that boy absorbed that slap like it wasn't nothing. What Matthew Henry is saying is if it is possible for you to suffer an injury, if you can absorb that for the sake of peace and committing your concerns to the Lord's keeping it is better to do that when possible than to get in an all out brawl over something unnecessary amen I hope I'm making sense tonight what Jesus was advocating was not a call to pacifism Do you know what pacifism is? It is a belief that there's no justifiable reason for violence and war. Even though that the psalmist said that God made my fingers to fight and to to war. That's what David was saying. What we're trying to tell you tonight is that there is nothing wrong with you if a person invades your home and tries to take your life for you to prevent them from taking your life. You three year old baby's life or to to take your wife's life. God does not have a problem with that. But there are times that there are things that we can let go that we should let go. Say amen. It's not worth it. Come on and say amen. Jesus wasn't advocating to his followers to allow people free reign to simply destroy the people of God. If you know anything about the war that has gone on over in the other lands that Israel and Hamas and different places of Iran and such as that, there are terrorist groups who will go in and rape the women. They will abduct their their families. They will destroy everything in sight. And if we were to go with pacifism, that would be the same as to say, just lay down and let the enemy do whatever he wants to do. But I got news for you. That's not the kind of God that we're serving and that's not what God's saying. Amen, Brother Eric, I'm here to tell somebody if the enemy tries to come in at midnight in a stealth mode armed and hijack my family, it is my responsibility
ability to take care of my family and protect them. I made a vow and an oath to do so. If I can avoid confrontation, at all means I'm supposed to. But when it comes right down to it, God has allowed us that right to defend our own families and honor. Amen. If that were not the case, there would have never been calls to war. There would have never been times in the Bible that God would have called nations to go to war with other nations. There would have never been times like that. What God is wanting us to do is be a people that are an emblem of the spirit of righteousness and holiness and godliness. And by doing so, that we will be able to have a testimony to lead other people to Christ. If all you ever do is brawl, you know what that means? Fight If all you ever do, you're confrontational and dramatic. Do you know anybody like that? They solve all of their problems with violence. Do you know that when God saves you, his goal is to transform you, to give you a different spirit? Amen. You say, well, I'm like my mama. I'm like granddaddy. I'm like Uncle Roger. You know what I'm saying? You're not supposed to be like Uncle Granddad or whoever. Amen. I'm telling you, you're supposed to be like Christ. And what the Lord has told you is when the time comes uh, if you cannot all do so turn the other cheek turn the other cheek it's not a popular thing to do and it's sure not easy say amen somebody this passage is best understood well first let me say this because I almost forgot this because I felt like when I when I read through this it's very important to include this and the ladies I'm sure will appreciate it but this was not a verse to call for wives to tolerate physical abuse in their home well, now, baby, you just got honey. You just got turned the other cheek. Let me tell you something, Mom. If, if he is beating you, bruising you, knocking you around, knocking you out, I mean, uh, you, you might need to find somewhere that you can get your family in a safe place until that rascal gets saved and gets right with God. Because this verse is not a justification for a man to beat on a woman. Say amen, somebody. That is no right for you to be on. What you're doing is you're, some of you men that would do that, some of you would freak completely out if, a, if somebody hurt your daughter. But what you're doing, some of you are doing the same thing to somebody else's daughter. Come on and say amen. But this, is not a, this passage is best understood in light of the times that it was written in. It was not uncommon for those who had a quarrel against each other to challenge the other person to something called a duel, like a sword fight or a face-off. Anybody watch old westerns, you know, where they get in, they make walk so many paces and turn around and, and shoot their gun and see who's the fastest draw in the west? Well, you know, long before there were ever any western days, it was a common practice that when someone had what we call today a beef with somebody else, can you imagine being at work, brother? Uh, uh, Curtis and the guy across the cubicle next to you and you can't hard to get along with him and you stand up you're like let's take this outside you get a sword and I'll get a sword and whoever comes out back in without with their head still on their shoulders we, we'll be at work tomorrow come on can you imagine that but in reality in the old days uh, in ancient times uh, it was not an uncommon thing when two people had a quarrel with each other even sometimes over the most foolish thing and a a lot of times it had to do with people feeling like somebody had disrespected them or come against their character or their reputation. They were willing to fight to the death over something petty. Do you know that in the prison system, that feeling, that vibe is still alive in 2023. If you've never been to prison, you've ever watched a prison documentary, or you know somebody in prison, let me tell you one of the worst things you can do. If you go to prison, don't go in there and disrespect somebody because disrespect will get you knocked out. Come on now. All you say something disrespectful, something hateful. It is a slight against a person's character, against their integrity. Listen, in prison, you ain't got much left. They've done taken just about everything from you. And if a man's dignity is the only thing he's got left, not too many going to put up with you coming against their dignity. But let me tell you the reason why this is valuable. Because when the Lord Lord says, offer the other cheek. It is the child of God saying, I place my dignity in the Lord's hands. If I can absorb this, I, if, I can, if I can look at them and they say all manner of things, well, you're stupid, you can't do nothing right. Gotcha. 
Thank you for all your confidence and to be able to turn around and walk away. Do you, you know, I asked you the question earlier, don't, don't you think all of us could use a little bit of help in the way we react to stuff? Come on now, because I don't know, but I, I've had times before I've had to ask the Lord, forgive me. What about you? I've had to say, God, please help me. Uh, but Jesus spoke against that knee-jerk reaction to defend our pride. Because at days in, a lot of times, that's what it's all about. You take somebody that backhands you across the face. Just let me put this in reality. Let's just take somebody that you ain't never really cared for because they always act like a jerk. Uh, and they just walk up to you one day randomly because they don't like something you say, and they, they backhand you in the face. Now, let me ask you, what would happen if somebody did that to you? Because the truth is, I had to stop and think about it today. Because there have been a few times that I, I be, I'm thinking to myself that the right way to handle that is, is I'm not going to let nobody get one up on me. But that's just my old nature trying to peel itself off the cross. See, when I was growing up, I didn't have much. And our family, we were poor. I've told some of you my story before. But this was my grandfather's philosophy about fighting. He, was, he wasn't a real big man himself. He was a pretty wild card. But my grandfather's philosophy was, if you get into a fight, I don't care how big the other guy is. I don't care how fast the other guy is. I don't care how strong the other guy is. If that guy starts getting the best of you, you are not going to lose if you have to pick something up and clobber him over the head with it. And the philosophy in our family was, if you get in a fight in school and you come home and we find out you got beat up, you're going to get a whooping. And ain't that crazy? That's about the way it was. But the reason that is because that is the old nature. That is to say, nobody's going to one-up my family. Nobody's going to one-up. Now, I know this may not be going over too well tonight because, listen, it goes against the flesh. Am I right? It goes against, it cuts and that's why I told you earlier, there's a lot of passages in the Bible. You're like, you know what? That's fine. I never, I really never wanted to smoke crack anyway, Pastor Myers. You know, never really appealed to me. That smoking, that not smoking crack, that, that's pretty easy for me. You know what? And uh, I've never been one to, you know, uh, fornicate. And I, I haven't been committing any adultery. I really love my spouse. I got no intentions on cheating on them. But there's some other things. There's some things that people can change, and yet the things that we don't change are the ones like this because people just let it fly. Listen, I, I'm just going to kind of be open and real and raw, okay, for here a minute. I've been around this for a long time, folks. I have met people that I mean that they, they got all kind of standards on the outside. They don't do this. They don't go there. They don't wear this. They wear that. They, they don't go to this place. They don't eat out on Sunday. They don't drink coffee. They don't drink Coke. They don't, I mean, all kinds. Of, they don't, they don't, they don't. But I'm telling you, if somebody makes them mad, buddy, you better look out. They will rip your head off, and they don't care about nobody. And then later on, they'll come around like, well, you know, you, I, I did that because of. And they always got some reason why to excuse away. Let me tell you, all of that is just as bad, if not worse, than anything else that you're pointing out in somebody else's life. We've got to use temperance in our life. Can you say amen? Because when our pride, when our dignity, when our reputation is marred or somebody comes against us, you know how that feels? You take somebody like me who grew up poor. We didn't have nothing. I got made fun of as a kid, and it made me mean. I fought all the time. So when as I got older, all it took was somebody to say something that made it out like I was stupid. They, they made it out like I don't know what I'm doing or, or some kind of something that I could connect back to my struggle in my past, and I would go crazy. But now I have to say, God, help me. Because the truth is, it's not God's will for us. It's not, it's not God's will for us to just brawl for the sake of letting people know you're not going to walk all over me. You know what I found out? There's a way to handle a lot of things that you don't have to handle everything with violence. It took me a long time to figure that out. And there's still been times before that it was still a difficult task. 
my son will tell you, they, they say something, I don't even know where they come up with this, but my boys have been working with me since they were probably 12, 13, 15, I don't know, been working with me for years. And, and they have told me and joked around before. They said, Dad, I have never met anybody who can tell somebody off like a pastor but without cuss words, and I have never met somebody that has the ability to do that. And I'm not telling you I'm proud of that, but, but in some part of me, I've figured out a way, Brother Eric, to let somebody know to back off without being hateful, without cussing somebody out. You know what I'm saying? Whenever people, because there's people in the world that will take advantage of you. Have you ever heard the saying, don't mistake my meekness for weakness? There are people, I've said this before. As a pastor, I'm also, I have a bivocational job. I also do construction. I own my own business. And you know what I found out? If someone finds out you are a pastor, all of a sudden, I guess you're supposed to do everything for free. You're supposed to do a job for next to nothing. And you're supposed to take whatever they, they give you. You're supposed to do like what well, you know, I'm there to make money. This is what I do for a living. And so people will take advantage of I got to the place that Brother Eric that I didn't just rush in to say, Yeah, I pastor church XYZ. I just tell them they ask, I say, Yes, I'm a Christian. They ask, Yes, I pastor church. I'm not trying to hide it, but I'm not going out there just to give you a reason to treat me maliciously. Because, like I said a while ago, just because I have the Spirit of God does does not give me, does not mean that I've got a welcome mat in front of me that says step on me. Say amen, somebody. Take advantage of me. And, I, I'm not, and especially my family. But I believe tonight a slap will not take your life. But you know, being shot could. Being backhanded isn't going to kill you. That's something you could absorb. That's something you might can take. Somebody telling you stupid. No, that ain't going to kill you. That's something you can absorb. Can I, can I encourage you tonight to just step back a little bit because we can learn how to handle our problems a certain way and that, we carry that through the rest of our life. And it becomes such a problem. There are people tonight that are in prison because at a young age they learn to handle all their problems with violence. I have literally had times before that when my kids were young and there was a situation where that I needed to make apology, I would tell my kids, they'd say, Dad, say, man, I thought you was going to kill that guy. I was, and I, a lot of times I'd be crying. I'd say, no. I said, you don't put that to God's charge. I said, I should have never let that guy get me that aggravated. I should have never done that. I said, because here's the thing. I didn't ever want to teach my kids that everything is handled like that that you're supposed to handle everything with physical violence. I've shared many of testimonies right here in the church. There's no, no new thing. But I am here to tell you there's got to be a balanced understanding of this passage because we as a people of God have got to stop using this knee-jerk reaction, just tell people off, give people a piece of our mind, and the first time, are you trying to insult me? Are you, try- are you coming at me? Are you? Oh, you are in my parking space. You better get out of here, you know. It's time that we use a little bit more of the nature of Christ because if the spirit of Christ is in us, our reaction should be different, should it not? Because to turn the other cheek can be a form of temperance, a self-control in our pride. This is what came to me when I read this, and I don't mean to sound like frozen, but when I read this, the first thing that came to my mind was it was almost like as God's saying this, through this whole chapter, like God is trying to reiterate the fact, let it go. I, I got so much more to say, but maybe I should just close right here on this thought. I touched on it a little bit earlier, but there are some things that are not worth it. There are some arguments with some people that are not worth it. You may prove your point, but you may lose a relationship. You may prove your point, but you may lose your marriage. You may prove your point, but you may, you may lose your job. You may come out on top and have bragging rights and a video to post on the Internet. But you also may lose your education. You may lose a lot of other things in life. 
things that later as you get older that you'll regret you want to go back and apologize for because there's a lot of things that come full circle. What do you mean by that? Well, I'll give you an example. When I was like 16 years old and I had two giant 15-inch speakers in the back of my car and I would have people tell me when I pull up in their yard that I was vibrating the pictures off their walls and the neighbors in the neighborhood could not stand whenever I would come home. It would drive them nutty. You ever hear these people that are boom, 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 boom down the drive, whatever, through the neighborhood? That was me. That was me. And guess what? Now that I'm older and I'm, I've had times that I'm trying to sleep and I'm trying to enjoy peace and quiet and I have somebody that's boom, 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 vibrating my windows, bzzz, bzzz, bzzz. what I'm telling you is, is that life has a way of coming full circle. Being a deviant, flying through people's neighborhood with a baseball bat, knocking people's mailboxes off the top, and yet over here, about three or four years ago, having to put a, another mailbox on the post over here because some deviant teenager decided to knock the mailbox off the post. But my point is, is this. There will be things in your youth and things throughout your life that if you don't think through that later on in life you're going to regret some of the decisions that you make. So it's time that you reconstruct the way you think. And you do that by submitting and surrendering yourself to the Spirit of God. Here's what I would advocate for you to do tonight. That you take your life before God and say, God, I might have been raised by my parents. I might have been uh, come up in a school system or around a lot of people that this was normal. Maybe you just got out of prison not too long ago. And this is just how it's always been. Don't you believe that when you get saved, there should be a process of transformation? And, and I'm going to try to close by showing you something. Anybody ever work with Lego blocks before? And you put the little blocks on, you snap another block on, you snap another block on. If you could just imagine tonight for, with me for a moment that your life from a young age starts out like that flat board and that Lego set and you put a block here and a block there, and through the years you're putting different pieces and parts of your life together. The whole framework of who you are right now has a lot to do with your history and the way things have you've accepted and the personality that you have evolved in. The moment that we accept Christ in our life, it is us saying, God, deconstruct what has been constructed and make me what you want me to be. And is that hit home for anybody? Is there anybody besides me? There was a lot of things and ways God had to de deconstruct. I'll tell you one of them. Some of you have heard my testimony. As embarrassed and shameful as it is to me, I had to ask the Lord and I had to seek the Lord for Him to deconstruct some of the most racist ideals and ideologies that I had developed through those little spiritual or emotional Lego blocks throughout my life and that system that was built, I had to let God deconstruct that and start the work over. Let me give you an opportunity tonight. Sister Moran, you want to come to the piano? You're more than welcome to tonight. I, I shared this because this is not, you know, sometimes I think we need to get outside of the norm and we need to preach things that maybe we don't often hear about, things that are of value to us. Because you may not realize this, but we're in the holiday seasons, and uh, you'd think that everybody's holly and jolly, and they're ready to get their Christmas on. But there's people that are stealing your parking space. They're going to steal Elmo out your, your, your arms. You're trying to get to Black Friday Elmo. You know what I mean? You're going to be at family reunion or family get-togethers, and people acting like they ain't got sense. I'm just telling you that this is a message that is going to make a break for some people whether they believe you when you say, I got saved. Let the proof be in the reaction. Just suppose somebody who knows you, when something crazy happens, they say, man, Mel must have really got a hold of God down there at Gray Street. So why do you say that? Ooh, did you see what happened the other day at that Thanksgiving get together boy in the past you'd have been ripping somebody's tonsils out of their throat and putting them on a plate 
man, she must have really got something down there. God must have really done something in her life. The proof is in your reaction. Because I can say a lot of things. Climb upon God's potter's wheel tonight, that pottery wheel, and let God mold you tonight. Find yourself a place to pray and to ask God to help you because this is an area that I believe that most everybody I know could use help in, including your pastor. When the Lord laid this on my heart, I began to envision in my mind how would I handle it if tomorrow I accidentally cut somebody off in traffic and they walked up to my car and slapped me in the face? How would I handle that? Do I have enough of God to just turn the other cheek? I'm telling you, there's a lot for us to take into consideration. I want you to leave this service knowing that every Christian has the right to defend their family's life. But we need to make sure that we're not using this knee-jerk reaction of confrontation, conflict, and being militant with everybody who crosses us the wrong way. God help us all. Lord, tonight I've done everything I can imagine to share exactly what you put in my heart. Many of us have been cut mentally, verbally, cut down. Sometimes the sore places in our life are a product of something we went through that the other person that's doing the cutting may not even know what they're talking about or what they're dealing with. And I just pray, God, that you'll help us to have the right spirit. You told us in your word that if we'll walk in the spirit, that we would not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So I pray tonight, God, if you will, to have mercy. Teach us your ways. Help us to have the kind of strength that when we're in that violent test and the enemy comes against us, to know when to let some things go. The people that have said things that hurt us, the things that people have said about us that made us upset, people that talked about our reputation. Help us to know when to let it go and keep walking. Because you said in your word, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Lord, we know that you were the supreme example when they drove those nails in your hands and your feet and they beat you with that cat of nine tails and ripped the flesh from your body until the entrails of Christ were hanging out. But like a lamb that was led to the slaughter, you opened not your mouth. You allowed that crowd to crucify you for the salvation of the whole world. I pray tonight, God, that if we could just win somebody by having the right spirit, the right attitude. Let the world see that we've changed. Let the world see Christ in us. Not the old me. Crucify that Adam flesh, Lord. Help me pull myself together. And I'm asking this in the name of Jesus. I give you praise for everything you've already done, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Holy, holy Lord God Almighty, I praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. What's amazing to me in this text is how Jesus continually reiterates the way we react. If someone sues you and takes your coat, how do you react to that? Give them your cloak too. If someone presses you to go a mile, he said, go with them too. 
If you got someone in need and they ask to borrow something, don't send them away empty. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. 